Darren, just check to say hi there, buddy. How's it going? Yeah, it's going well. Good. Good to have you uh, running the Zoom today. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm doing my best. I have not felt well today, so I'm, I'm hoping it's just a little, you know, sniffle, but we'll get through it. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hope, hope you're feeling better. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. Got to get got to get better by the weekend. That's that's I'm a weekend warrior right now. So, <laughs> um, okay. So why don't we why don't we get started? Um, I'd like to do a quick intro for uh, our guest tonight. Um, we we want to thank Dave Rocky Rockwell uh, for joining us um, for this uh, Leon Chandler TU program. Um, I reached out to Rock about a month ago, and, and I've um, been able to call him Rock, and he seems to prefer that. So um, I reached out to Rock about a month ago, and he was really enthusiastic about doing this. And um, I know that a lot of folks, clearly everyone that joined this really, you know, have a lot of adoration for our Atlantic Salmon. And I know I've always wanted to learn more, but just really haven't uh, delved into that as much as I wish I, I I would have at this point. So we're going to learn some some good stuff tonight. Um, Rock is actually going to start out with um, some flies, and he's going to talk flies uh, a little bit. And he said that he's happy to take questions um, as we go along. You can feel free as well to maybe type a question in the chat, and then maybe we can get to it after he does that segment. But if you just, um, I guess, want to you know throw your question out there. Rock said he was, you know, um, more than willing to, you know, address any questions you might have about fly design for salmon. But uh, Rocky is um, a decorated military veteran with tours of duty in Vietnam and Iraq. Uh, and he is retired with the permanent army rank of major. Um, he has spent quite a bit of time uh, studying Atlantic salmon in our region. And that's in part from his long association with the Salmon River. Um, he's fished the Salmon River for three decades uh, and counting, and um, has been a part of the Douglas and Salmon Run uh, guide network since 1999. So, um, without further ado, Rock, I'd uh, I'd like to hand it over to you so we can get started. Well, it's a real privilege to be with you guys tonight. And I'm like I said before, I my home water was a Tafni Yoga when I was a youngster, <laughs> and my dad actually introduced me to Leon Chandler years and years ago. So this is a, a thrill for me. I was asked by Don, and I really appreciate Don's help. He's been marvelous because this is really my first Zoom with a PowerPoint. And I've been asked to talk about landlocked salmon flies, and uh, they really run the full gamut. I do have some, uh, some knowledge of uh, what works here. Uh, I use a lot of buggers. I use a lot of buggers for steelhead, and I use a lot of buggers for, uh, for landlocks. And I usually start out uh, on the river with a, with a black bugger and uh, I switch to a white. But over the years, what I've found is that little thin mint down there, I don't necessarily use that pattern, but I don't have a good picture of a multicolored tail on a, on a uh, bugger. So I use a lot, uh, at least two colors of my bugger tails because I know that trout see contrasting colors the best. So uh, I've had some good luck with contrasting colors. Red and uh, uh, olive have been my, my go-to on, on, on the river, but uh, I'm, I'm a big bugger fan. I tie some of them as uh, articulated, but you can't go wrong with a bugger wherever you go. Uh, and we'll talk about how I tie uh, flesh flies now. I don't tie them in the typical manner. I tie them like a bugger. All right, I got to change slides here. Uh, nymphs, of course, Salmon River is a very buggy river. It's a buggy river because of the uh, salmon carcasses. So uh, it has a ton of, uh, of, of stone flies. This Pat's rubber leg has been become a very popular pattern up here. As a guide, I know I'm going to lose six, eight, a dozen flies a day with, with guests. It's just that kind of a river. So I tend to uh, uh, tie very, very quick, simple patterns. But uh, over the last five or six years, this red fox nymph has been excellent for me. And that's the first nymph I tie on uh, is that red fox nymph. And based on water conditions and clarity and, and sunlight, 
that tells me what size to use. Water temps, the uh, colder the water, the smaller. But that's been a really uh, good fly for, for the steelhead. Hey, Rock. Yeah. Do, do you prefer the, the, the Whitlock brand of the, the dubbing? There's a few of them out there. And there's the Whitlock SLF that's kind of the popular and, and common dubbing yep. blend. That's the pattern I use is Whitlock's. I just saw another video using rabbit dubbing. I may try that. It looked a little quicker, but the, the Whit, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a big fan of Dave Whitlock anyway, but that's a great pattern. That has really paid off for me as a guide over the last five, six years. And we do have golden stones in the river. And the, just one tip on the stone flies, around the last week of April, first couple of weeks of May, everybody will tell you the steelhead are gone. Well, they're not. They're in the heaviest uh, uh, current, the most uh, dramatic water, and I fish for them with heavily weighted stone flies under an indicator, and I, I'll catch flies uh, steelhead up, up to a week or 10 days after everybody says they're gone. So. Okay, egg patterns, of course. Um, when I talk about the main presentation about landlocks, we know there's summer on fish, but the, way, the best time of the year for me to predict them is in the spring when that water temperature hits 50, there's going to be an opportunistic feeding run of landlocked salmon that are going to stay in the lower river. How long they stay up there is probably based on water temperatures and water flows, but they, can't, they come up for that spring buffet of steelhead eggs. They don't run all the way up the river, and uh, that's the, the, the time I can predict them the best is 50 degree water and it's an, a good egg bite uh, at that point in time. I, 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 I tied some op flies this winter. I broke down and tied because I like easy flies. But this Y2K pattern I tie a lot and it's tied with egg yarn and it's an easy pattern to tie, minute and a half, and you can use a single color, two colors, or three colors uh, to make your egg pattern. And when it's wet, it looks eggy. So that's a that's a good pattern. So, so what are your favorite? Oh, oh, got an echo there. I don't know if that's me. <laughs> You're good. What are your favorite? If you pick like a couple of different mop chenille colors, what would you pick? Uh, you know, pink is always a is always a good spring color. And uh, uh, well, I'm trying to. Uh, Dark day, steelhead, black and blue. I use black and blue a lot. Uh, bright day, I use the, I've used i used blue and orange. Uh, that orange and chartreuse is hard to beat. That's a, a popular color in your nuke egg and the Y2K. Uh, let me say this, and I should have started out saying this. 99% of our fishing up here is migratory fish. They're not as sensitive as a resident fish. They're coming up, they want to spawn, they're sorting out mates, they can be extremely aggressive. So the pattern isn't always that important, it's the presentation. It's presentation over pattern. So when I first started guiding, I was so focused on the pattern and the size, and I'm not anymore. I'm focused on, on the presentation. And primarily, most of what we do is a bottom bite, just enough weight to take the bottom. Uh, but there are some times when, when, when swinging is preeminent and, you know, the fly can, can be three inches under the surface. A drop back uh, steelhead, he'll move 10 feet for a fly. Presentation over pattern. Okay. Okay, our typical popsicles and uh, uh, streamers work. That white death, the last five or six years, I've used that a lot. And it's been a really good fly for me. It's been so good, I tie it down to a number 12 and use it for stream trout. I'll often tie a Whitlock a Red Fox nymph, uh, size 16, 18 inches behind it. It's really worked very well for me. So the guy that developed that, I think he developed it to dead drift. Do you do the same? Do you let it? I dead drift it, yeah. 
Yeah, I like this streamer because, uh, like, in the same way I like a woolly bugger, because you can dead drift it, it, and as it pops off the bottom, sometimes that's your trigger point. But as it swings, it's still an effective pattern. It's looking like a leech or a minnow. So I think you're a bit more efficient. So a lot of times when guys are fishing eggs or nymphs, I'm fishing a small uh, bugger or this white death. Now, I have a horn bird there. In the summer when these fish run, the book says they run in June and July, but I have seen them run in May. Uh, and uh, when it's, if it's a warm May, mid-May and it's warm, I put on that horn bird, I fish it as a dry fly. I do this in the upper fly zone all summer. And then when it's, when it starts to drag, you pop it and it goes under and you swing it. And my biggest landlock has come on that Hornberg. I got one about 16. I have a picture of it later on. So, you know, these, these fish will hit the full gamut. They're aggressive. When they come up in the spring, they're, they're the apex predator in the river. I've seen them chase the uh, chub up on the bank. So. Now, in the summer, they go all the way up as far as they can go in the headwaters to spawn. And so the upper fly zone becomes a, uh, a great destination. Guys will go up there and they fish the, your typical buggers and streamers and nymphs, but there is a very good dry fly bite uh, in the summer on these uh, 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 with your landlocked salmon. These are big, bulky attractor patterns. These are tens and twelves, and uh, that's what we fish up there. And uh, you know, I, I feel bad because. The state has put a lot of effort in reintroducing these landlocked salmon. And it's unpredictable how many we're going to see each year. I mean, I always see them. But the fact that remains that uh, these fish spawn in, in September, October. They drop back through all those salmon fishermen upriver. And there's, there's a lot of landlocks killed. Why the state allows anybody to keep one landlocked salmon when we're trying to reintroduce the species, I don't know. And I'm sure that half the guys that are snagging salmon upstream cannot recognize a landlock from a steelhead or a brown trout. So uh, it's, that's a sad story, but they're the most magnificent fish in the river. If you hook one, if you've ever hooked one, you know as soon as you start to lift the rod and you feel that he's out of the water. He's out of the water six or eight times the first 30 seconds. His runs are, I think, are twice as long as a steelhead. They're just uh, something you'll never forget. Questions, comments? I have caught these fish on a San Juan worm. So I had a, uh, a client for years, he came up, he's really a nice man. He's passed now, he had Lou Gehrig's disease. So when he first started coming up, he could use a fly rod. A couple of years later, he had to use a spinning rod. A couple of years later, I had to cast for him and hand him the rod. So we're uh, fishing one of the pools on Douglaston and I, we weren't doing anything. So I put a San Juan worm on. This is a spring, that early spring run with an indicator and I threw it out. And I don't know how big that fish was, but it was high teens. And uh, we didn't land it, but it was a thrill. <laughs> Sam Wanworm. I think that's the last slide. With the, yeah, that was the last. You want to go to the uh, other? Yep. Yeah, I was uh, answering a question in the chat. So a lot of the reference here is for the Salmon River. That's kind yeah. of, that's Rock's home river. Um, yeah nothing to say that a lot of these same flies wouldn't really you know do the do the ticket ticket on our local creeks and um in our streams around here well i fished a couple of the streams down there and and you guys got a marvelous fishery as long as you got water you guys are yeah. in good yeah. shape <clears throat> yeah you want me to, i'll start now. yep yeah yep. okay so yep if you feel comfortable going through the yep. motions yeah i'm good this is a fish uh, from uh, 2017. It was oh, in the we don't, spring. We don't have the we don't have the screen oh. yet. Doc. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I I get it. Here we go. That's okay. I'm teachable, barely. <laughs> All right. This is a see how still, thick still that no fish still is? no share. Yep, we still we still don't have it. Oh my gosh! All right, let's see. Did you stop share on the other one? 
I probably didn't. All right, I gotta, I gotta exit out of this. And then I you'll hit, back. Yeah, I hit escape. All right. Yep. You go back to Zoom and click share screen, and then you'll yeah. pick the screen that you want to share. Yeah. All right. There we go. I'm sorry. That's okay. Let's see. I get to go back one. All right. Here we go. I'm going to. Sh nice. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry about that. I'm teachable. All right, here we go. See the, the girth on this landlocked salmon? It is, you know, normally, normally they're torpedo shaped. And this was an April day. We went down the river. I took the water temp, 50 degrees. I said, we're going to get a landlocked today. And, and there must be a god because we did. That was a, that was a bugger. They caught that on a bugger. Couple more. This is uh, 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 right down the stairs from the DSR office, and that's an April fish again. This is a last week fish. That's a nice landlock. And it's a female. <clears throat> it looks like it spawned out. Nor normally they're a little darker when they drop back to the lake, but the females do pick up that uh, fresh uh, run silver color quicker than the males. So I think that's a female dropping back to the lake. And it was released. At Douglaston, we don't keep any trout or landlocked salmon. You can keep your three Pacific salmon, but that's it. So they're two very nice fish. Uh, the landlocked salmon is a great environmental indicator. You know, they don't tolerate uh, pollution very well. Uh, We'll talk about some of the factors that led to their extirpation. It only took the uh, took us 79 years to extirpate them from both sides of the lake. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, they're certainly a great fish. This is glacial Great Lake Iroquois. 12,000 years ago, the ice sheet in the uh, left-hand corner up there is the last of the three Wisconsin ice sheets retreating north. It blocked the St. Lawrence River centered on what is now Cape Vincent. So the Atlantic salmon that got into Lake Ontario for a period of time could not make that 1100 mile journey back to the, uh, to the ocean. So there's a question about did they voluntarily become landlocked or did they involuntarily became landlocked because of the ice sheet? We'll talk about that in a bit. But I want you to notice Lake Ontario or the Great Lake Iroquois is 100 feet higher. It floods all the way into Oneida Lake and it floods all the way into Cayuga Lake and, and certainly the excess into Seneca and Cuca and Canandaigua is, is pretty simple. So all these lakes at one time had landlocked salmon in it. This is Lake Ontario today. And, uh, you know, the lake used to run right up to what is now uh, the throughway. And that was probably because of the sand dunes built up there. And that was where the Indians had their main trails. And that, the, that's where the roads and the wagon trails and eventually the throughway went in. So history, history is important. This is watershed itself starting on the west side of the Tug Hill, going all the way to the lake. You're going from about uh, 750 feet here at Redfield down to 300 feet at Lake Ontario. So we'll, we'll just talk about the watershed really quickly. A lot of you guys are familiar with it. This is the Upper Salmon River Reservoir or Redfield Reservoir. It is gorgeous. 95% of this lake is, the shoreline is pristine. There's only cottages on 5%. I have a camp down here uh, uh, with three acres. In fact, if anybody's interested in moving up here, we're, 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 we're selling. So uh, just a little advertisement. But uh, this lake used to be, uh, when it was impounded in uh, 1914, was a trout lake because of the tributaries coming in to the tributaries to the Salmon River. And over time, it's become a warm water species. It's uh, famous for bass. 
it's got a good walleye population now. It has crappies. It's a, it's a, it's a just a beautiful lake to come up and see and, and fish. This is the uh, Redfield Dam, and I want to. I've got this in here because I wanted to say something about the water flow. When these dams were built, they were built to generate water power. There was no thought about the fishery or 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 the industry in town it was about uh, generating uh, electricity they had high capacity generators they would run that water flow until there was no more water left in the lake and then they'd shut it down until it filled back up so what that did was that ensured there was no natural reproduction of fish in the river and it also interrupted the annual life cycle of the bugs so it wasn't a very buggy river when the water was flowing so in 1997, they had to relicense that dam. It was a federal issue. The federal government made the power companies sit down with 26 different groups of stakeholders and make agreements. And what they agreed on is a minimal flow for Salmon River. It changes during three seasons, but the absolute minimal flow if water is available in the summer is 185 CFS. That allows the bug life cycle to continue and it allows natural reproduction of fish. In our sport species, species probably 50 to 60% of our sport species, species are natural reproduced fish. That's extremely important to us. You got the falls. If you've never seen this falls, they've got a nice little parking lot and a parking area and the signs up there. It's a nice place if you ever come up with your kids or your wife, it's, it's great. The hatchery, uh, <coughs> sorry, before I get to the hatchery, we have Lighthouse Hill Reservoir, 1929. This is very important because this small reservoir, 164 acres, is what controls the water in the river. The problem being it's only 164 acres. The topography being that any time there's rain, the runoff is very quick. The power company has little time to figure out when to release. They have to release. The uh, guy that's the chief engineer for this uh, uh, power plant and this watershed has five other plants he supervises, but this is the last one he checks at night because this is the most sensitive to water flow. If you see the picture in the lower right, you see the river coming out dead center. On the left, you see an overflow. Let's say it's uh, <clears throat> first week of April, the steelhead are up in the river, there's spawning going on, we have a heavy rainstorm, water has to go over that uh, overflow. That will attract a lot of the steelhead up into that overflow, and then once that water uh, goes back down, those fish get stranded. There's a series of little ponds in the woods and in, in, in that hard rock bed. And we've gone up there and pulled and netted over 50 steelhead and got them back in the main main river. So they're very, they try never to use that overflow. So there's just, just no wiggle room. The water water is uh, comes out of there pretty quick. They would like to manage it for the fishery, but they do the best they can for us. And I, I'm really confident they do. Of course, it's great to have a hatchery on the on the river. This hatchery was supposed to go somewhere else, and I I, I you have to find out where it was supposed to go. But we had a state senator named H. Douglas Barkley, who you may be familiar with, who owns uh, uh, Douglas and Salmon Run, and he was instrumental in getting that hatchery on the river. Uh, just above the hatchery, of course, is the uh, upper fly zone. And below the hatchery is the lower fly zone. Some of you may, that's Altmar, New York. This is the flood from 2010 at the lower fly zone. This is a pretty dramatic event. I don't know if any of you ever saw it. I was on this bridge that morning. Believe it or not, guys were up here for salmon season and they uh, crossed the barrier. They walked across the bridge and they were fishing in the parking lot on the far side. So uh, that's salmon fishermen for you, I think. But the normal flow is 185 to about 500 cubic feet per second, maybe up to 1,000. The flood overnight went from uh, 500 to 26,000 cubic feet per second. So pretty dramatic. 
we found salmon 50 feet up in the trees uh, the next day, or three days later. This is the flood in, in Altmar, or in, I'm sorry, in Pulaski. And this uh, wall actually washed out and they were afraid it was gonna wash out further and hit the sewage treatment plant, which would have really uh, been a disaster for us, but it, they were able to prevent that. And after you get uh, uh, out of Pulaski going towards the lake, you get to Douglas and Salmon Run, which is a, a beautiful place to fish. It's uh, one of the premier holes, upper clay. This is a great uh, landlocked salmon pool in the, in the summer. That's the tail out of the meadow pool. Gorgeous. And of course, as we get to the lake at 300 feet above sea level, you got Port Ontario. And that was the first little village established up here uh, seven years before Pulaski. Pulaski's first name, by the way, was Fishtown. So that uh, lighthouse is still there. Okay, at one time was considered the greatest salmon lake and river in the world. Uh, you see here a uh, landlock taken in the meadow pool. The uh, Native Americans have exploited the uh, landlocked salmon for a number of years. The first indication of Native Americans in the area was fish, or, I'm sorry, a boat building tools found at Fort Drum on a, a small trib of the uh, Indian River dating back to 11,000 BC. So that's a long time ago. But the uh, Tug Hill itself was pretty tough uh, living in the winter. So the Mohawk, uh, the Iroquois Indians would come up the lake in their canoes and they would camp in the summer uh, near Port Ontario on the lower river and they would net and spear these landlocked salmon. And they called the river by an Indian name where the fish, the, where the sweet fish swims. The first written record we have, and you can see it on the internet, is Father uh, Jesuit Fathers Lee Mercier and Lemoyne. They came across, their first white men to cross uh, Lake Ontario and they crossed with the uh, French military and they were going to punish the Senecas for, uh, uh, for a previous battle. Uh, they were unsuccessful and, and had to go back. But the, the uh, Jesuits talked about the fish being so thick they pushed one another out of the bank. The fish at that time and when the first white settlers got here averaged 15 to 45 pounds. So that's something to think about. Uh, Governor DeWitt Clinton was a fisherman. He's the guy Clinton's ditch, the Erie Canal. Uh, very influential governor. And he traveled in the area. He traveled to Oswego, and he was the first guy to note that the dams were going to have an impact on the viability of the of salmon spawn. So at that time, salmon spawned in every major trib of the lake. The only the only place they didn't spawn was the Niagara River, and that was probably because the current was too strong or the gravel wasn't right. But they did not uh, spawn in the in Niagara River. The commercial fishery took off as soon as the first white settlers got here in 1801. And it was, uh, you know, a lot of these farms in the area, a lot of the older people can remember their grandparents and great grandparents talking about how they bought their farm uh, based on uh, the salmon they caught. So, uh, see the numbers were pretty extraordinary. And they were abundant. They were abundant up to the Civil War. People thought we'd never run out of salmon. Uh, farmers used pitchforks to get them and they used them to fertilize. And some of these older people will tell about the hired men complaining about having to eat salmon every day. So it was, it was an extraordinary fishery. <coughs> well, the dams were constructed, which limited the uh, landlocks from getting to their prime uh, spawning waters. Uh, commercial fishing was still active. Seth Green, in an effort to replace the brook trout, which couldn't tolerate the pollution of the time, brought the uh, rainbow trout here from uh, California in 1871. And by 1879, the landlocked salmon was extirpated from the Salmon River and all the tribs on, on the uh, American side. They lingered uh, a slow death on the Canadian side to about 1898. 
but in less than 100 years, this tremendous fishery was entirely gone. Uh, 1883 and 1898, they tried to replace the fishery by bringing in king salmon and Atlantic salmon flat fry, but they never paid attention to the pollution, so there was no survival, no recovery. Uh, you see here in this, this uh, commercial boat, he's netting Cisco's. They called them herring at the time. But uh, that was a tremendous food fish. We'll talk about the Cisco in detail because that was the primary forage fish in the lakes for a long time. I do a presentation on the perfect environmental storm, 300 years of Great Lakes history and what actually happened. And it's just cataclysmic to these lakes. How they ever come back, I, it's hard to understand, but we, we've done some good things in the last generation. Causes were commercial fishing, industry and mining, because uh, all that uh, refuse was thrown back in the rivers. Everything was thrown back in the rivers. Logging and clear cutting. Tremendous amount of logging, tremendous amount. All that sawdust went into the streams. The sawdust was such a problem in some of the harbors, they had to dredge it out every year. And if you think of sawdust sinking in the river, it it sinks to the bottom, it sinks, covers the gravel, covers the spawning beds and is impermeable layer. You can't, fish can't spawn and the bugs can't uh, regenerate. So that was terrible. We already talked about the dams. The end of Lake Erie was this tremendous swamp. Uh, uh, so around 1830 to 1850, they decided to drain the swamp. They put in 15,000 miles of drainage pipe and ditches. And shortly thereafter, they started getting the algae bloom, bloom, blooms in Lake Erie because that swamp is what filtered the water going into Lake Erie. Uh, farming, of course, produced its own problems with clear cutting and then, and, and of course, the, uh, the uh, fertilizers. General pollution, everything went into the rivers. Nobody paid any attention to it. And invasive species, there's 187 invasive species in, in the lake right now. 57, they estimate, came from ballast from the uh, ocean-going uh, ships that, that sail into it. It's a tremendous issue, these invasive species, and uh, we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. The landlocked salmon itself, when I say a discrete stock per tributary, they were discreet. They were so discreet that if you caught a landlocked salmon in 1850 and you brought it to the, to the park in Palat, any fisherman could tell you what trib that fish came out of. Because some tribs they were stocky, some tribs they were more torpedo shaped, some tribs they have different coloration. So uh, it was quite distinct. Now, if a population is using one primary tributary, approximately 3% of those fish will wander somewhere else. And that's nature's way of protecting that DNA strain in case there's a cataclysmic event in its own stream. So nature's a hell of a lot more complex than we ever gave it credit for. We thought we could fix this all with hatcheries, and now we know we, of course we can. Of course, the landlocked salmon is a summer run fish. They say June, July. And, and, and that varies. Uh, like I say, I, I, I kind of target them in May if I have the time. The spring run has been very good to me because the 50 degree tells me that, I'm, that they're going to be available quickly. So uh, once this river hits 50 degrees, I, I got three or four guys who want me to call them up to come up and fish, target the landlock. It's been very good for me for a long time. And like I already said, September, October, they're spawn and they're dropping back through the Pacific salmon. The pars will stay in the in, in, in one to three years in the stream before they migrate to the lake. I think in this uh, river, most of them go back the first year, just like the steelhead. The, the steelhead are on their way to the river in, in May every year. We see them in clouds going back to the lake. Or I'm sorry, the, the Pacific salmon. We just see clouds of these one inch fingerling. You'll st stay, you'll, you'll go down to the river at Douglaston, and in the soft uh, uh, current, you'll see dimples. You see these little one inch silver fingerling look like they're taking flies. 
So I asked the DEC what's happening because I couldn't see any fly hatching. And he says, those fingerlings are feeding on the flakes of last fall's dead salmon carcasses. And that's true because on the West Coast, they've tried to introduce salmon stocks in streams that haven't had them for 30 years. They put out the viper box with the eggs and they melt and they go down every day. Well, the eggs hatch, produces the, uh, uh, the alvin with a little egg, egg yolk, and they come down six or seven days later and the, all these fish are dead because there's been no salmon carcasses. So now on the West Coast, they take salmon carcasses and they put them in what looks like a wood chipper and they spray the banks and they're able to reestablish salmon stock. So, and of course the adults uh, like clear cold lakes. Uh, I put in here the max temp because in the tributaries, uh, it'll get 74, 75 degrees occasionally in the upper fly zone. And we generally, uh, uh, I generally won't fish it if it's over 70. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, it's very seldom we have that, that uh, warm water, but it, it does happen. It was warm this summer. Hey Rock. Yeah. You got a question in the chat. I'm not sure if you're going to get to it later. If so, maybe just wait. It's uh, what effect, if any, does the current state of and changes to environmental regulations have on the landlocked salmon? I don't know if that comes up later. Or if you want to answer, no, that. we can we can talk about it now. I mean, the temperature is obviously warming, and that's not good for any trout species. Uh, they would be sensitive during their spawning period in the headwaters. If those headwaters got, you know, up in the mid to high 70s, that would that would be a, put a real hurting on them, I think. Uh, the biggest hurdle for these fish, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is the alloy. And I've got a slide on that. But, uh, you know, we do stream reme remediation. Uh, you know, Tunison Lab in Cortland is, is, is very instrumental in trying to bring these, these species back. So uh, any questions, I'll take whenever. Hopefully I can answer them. Okay, uh, uh, it originated in freshwater species and we, we talk about uh, some of their problems with the alewife. Uh, that's important. Uh, they, they started as a freshwater species and migrated where they became a more or less a uh, ocean species spawning in fresh water. The landlocked salmon is genetically identical to the Atlantic salmon and uh, their history and behavior is virtually the same. Are they voluntarily landlocked or involuntarily landlocked because of that ice sheet? Uh, the current research says they probably voluntarily landlocked because the water conditions, the water temp, the water flow, the gravel beds, and the uh, availability of feed, they just decided they could stay and eliminate that 1,100 one-way mile trip back to the Atlantic. So uh, there are four 1830-era landlocked salmon in a Canadian museum. They did skill <coughs> samples and tests on those fish. And the best we can determine that these fish just decided to stay, they're voluntarily landlocked. And that's really been uh, confirmed by research on the West Coast with steelhead. Steelhead will come up and spawn. They'll produce uh, the young steelhead. Some of those, in some places, those steelhead will stay and become resident fish. Conditions are, are, are right. So uh, I always, I found that quite interesting. Now, people say they mix up a fresh run brown trout from a, from a landlocked salmon. All right, well, number one, the brown trout, especially from Lake Ontario, are football shaped. The landlocked is much more uh, uh, torpedo shaped. But the brown trout bites like a brown trout. Dogged short runs, occasionally it will jump, but mostly they'll wallow on top. The landlock, he's in the air as soon as, you, as, soon as he feels the hook and his runs are sizzling and, and uh, uh, dramatic. It's a much more dramatic fish. So the best way to tell is from the fight really. And uh, uh, you can get some color in, in, in the, in the um, uh, landlock, but not a lot. Now this landlock you're looking at in the lower picture has X's. 
is marked. Now, not all of them will have the X's, but the majority in Salmon River have X's. Now, the thought is we know that we've stacked six subspecies of landlocks in the river. The uh, landlock it's done the best is a main variety. And I'm having a, uh, I can't think of the name of the lake, but uh, that fish has done the best. In the 1850s, that lake in Maine had a problem with their landlocks and they took fish from Salmon River up there to, to uh, reinvigorate their stocks. So those fish from that uh, lake in Maine may be our native fish and maybe that's why they're doing better than, than the other fish. Okay, uh, uh, we already talked about the Sebaco strain, we talked about the invasives, natural reproduction. Uh, the goal is to have a self-sustaining population and uh, to have a self-sustaining population, I think we need enforcement and we don't. It's not the DEC or the, 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 uh, the, the individual officer's fault, the state's in financial trouble. One of the first places the state cuts is the fisheries part of the, uh, of the uh, DEC. So we just don't have enough officers. Uh, where we used to see officers up here, we used to see special officers during salmon season. We don't see any of that anymore. And these guys work hard. It's not that they're, you know, it's not that we don't have aggressive, dedicated uh, uh, agents, but we just don't have the enforcement we need. You've seen it where you are. <clears throat> okay, uh, just a couple pictures of the eggs and the and the small. And again, Tunison Lab is is uh, very involved with this. Uh, just some more pictures from the lab. Uh, when they first uh, started the program, they were looking at juveniles and they thought they were brown trout and they took them back to the lab and they found that they were Atlantic. So that was a big deal back in the late 90s. Uh, environmentally, we know we've got the zebra and the uh, quagra mussels. They're filtering the one-celled animals, the, uh, the poria here, the shrimp-like uh, feed. They depend on that one cell animals. And so we are having a real problem with uh, those tiny, tiny uh, forage in the lake. And again, that's based on uh, the, the, the incredible influx of zebra and guagra mussels. All right, I'm talking about the Cisco now. <clears throat> Years ago when they were, the commercial fishery was going full black. They're talking about netting herring. Well, the herring were actually ciscos. There's four varieties of ciscos. They have just a little bit different niche in the lake, mostly based on water depth. They were the perfect prey fish, soft grade, high protein, high fat, high oil content. Uh, that's, that's, they're a member of the trout family, and that's why uh, I said they're so popular as a commercial fish. They're also uh, canaries of cold water. They, they tell you if pollution's a problem. So the DEC does 150 trawls in the river every, or I'm sorry, in the lake every spring. They de do these trawls to determine the forage base, primarily, uh, you know, 90%, 95%, 99% alewives. And there's nine years groups of alewives and, and the, the DEC monitors their size and their abundance and and for the last three years, they've cut salmon stocking 20% each year because 99% of the Pacific salmon prey is alewife. Well, somewhere along the, the way in doing these trawls, they found a few remnant Cisco populations. So around 2012, <clears throat> they started restocking these and that was done through Tunison Lab. So hopefully we'll get some uh, reproduction of Cisco's. Uh, they're, they're, they're a great, great forage fish. This is a, a Cisco netting back in 1882. Again, they called it herring, but they're the, the Cisco. Now here's invasives. The DEC calls them naturalized. The steelhead are, 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 are from the West Coast. A very narrow band from Baja, California, up along the coast through Canada to Alaska over to the Kamchatka Peninsula. 
they're now stocked in every continent uh, except South uh, uh, Antarctica. Uh, one half of all hatchery fish by weight are rainbows or steelhead. Brown trout originally came here in 1883 from uh, uh, Brown, uh, Germany. When I was a kid, everybody talked about German browns, but that wasn't true because in 1886, Scottish browns came. Unfortunately, they came to the same hatchery and they got mixed with the German browns. And so it's just a brown trout now. And of course, we already talked about Seth Green and the rainbow trout. Uh, this is a, uh, 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 what we call domestic rainbow, a little thicker than the steelhead, uh, not as aerial, fights more like a brown trout. They're called domestic because they've been domesticated in the hatcheries to spawn in the fall. So we're seeing them in the river right now. Some years we'll see quite a few of them. And when they're colored up, they are really extraordinarily beautiful fish. Of course, the uh, king salmon and the coho salmon, we got those in the late 60s from Michigan. And just like Michigan, they took off here. Uh, you know, they're a tremendous fight. And uh, they have a tremendous audience now. Uh, we talk about pollution. Well, if there was significant pollution in our tribs, you'd hear about it because people do not want any interference with these uh, Pacific salmon. They're really, really a popular fish. Uh, I have other thoughts on them, but uh, for right now, they are, they are what makes the economy go in this town. Last guy's economy is based on his fishery. Okay, we talk about some of the, uh, uh, the negative uh, invasives, and we've got obviously the, the lamprey. The lamprey showed up in 1835. We think it got here through the Erie Canal system. It took it about another 15 years to work out, it's all the way to Superior. So uh, it's a very efficient invasive species. It uh, has killed a lot of fish. In the 1900s, 1930s, and 40s, it decimated the, uh, land, uh, the uh, lake trout. So the lake trout were no longer preying on the alewives. So the alewives exploded in this new vacant niche. So uh, the uh, lamprey has a tremendous uh, impact on the lake. It's a very aggressive parasite. It has a seven year life cycle. It only can kill fish in its last year. Up until that time, they, they live in the tribs. And they can kill up to 40 pounds of fish. You see here a DEC student being, <laughs> they'll latch on to anything. You gotta be very careful when you, when you net a steelhead or a salmon, it's got a, a lamprey on it. If you go to grab it, he'll, he'll grab you in a heartbeat. There's a variety of controls. Our uh, uh, lamprey controls are run by the Canadians. The Canadians come over here, they treat the river with this TFM. The Bay LaRue side is a chemical they use in the river plume and the mud where the river comes out in the lake. There's several other high-tech uh, uh, controls for them. There's a C lamprey genome, uh, genome pro project. I don't know if the DEC is using that. In any event, all these treatments cost a lot of money. Invasives cost billions of dollars in the Great Lakes every year. Some of you have probably need to smelt at one time. There used to be a tremendous fishery of smelt up here. Uh, they were probably uh, impacted by the zebra and quagra mussels, but you very seldom see it. I've heard there's still a smelt fishery on the western end of the lake. Water may be a little warmer because the water's coming in from Erie, I'm not sure. But that was a tremendous forage fish for, for a long time. They were so prolific in Lake Ontario that there was no limit. You could take all you wanted. They're good eating fish too. Do you remember the alewife die-offs we used to have? Well, uh, a slight change in temperature, winter or summer, would create these tremendous alewife die-offs. I can remember guys uh, shoveling them up in front of their camps on the lake and burning them and the stink and the smell. And they would have to close the state parks on the lake to swimming because it was so filthy and rotten. 
But as soon as they stocked these uh, Pacific salmon, that went away. That 18, uh, 1967 die-off in Michigan, that was the last year that the uh, Pacific salmon took care of them. Your alewife, and this is important. The alewife is an invasive species, 1873. We don't know their origin. Uh, <clears throat> Seth Green tried to bring shad in from uh, Connecticut. They could have come with, with that uh, uh, planting. They could have gotten through the, uh, the, uh, the canal systems. Uh, we, we just don't know. Or there could have been a, a remnant population in the lake and they exploded once the uh, lamprey started wrecking havoc with the uh, lake trout. They had thiaminase in their skin. Thiaminase uh, induces a thiamine deficiency, vitamin B1. B1 is critical to carbohydrate metabolism, which is critical to energy production. So about uh, five, six, seven years ago, we had two years where we were picking up steelhead. It looked like they were improperly released. Their head's up in the current, but they can't maintain it in the current. And they're slowly going backwards, slowly going backwards. We would pick them up, try to uh, resurrect them, they'd swim off and then five minutes later, they're right back. We think that was the, two, the, the, the lake had frozen over for almost two years. We think that steelhead populations got isolated with uh, a large number of uh, alewives and they fed exclusively as alewives. And this is the first time a non-native population of fish had this early mortality syndrome. Now, if these fish got to the hatchery, they would inject them with thiamine B1 and they'd be fine. So besides the early mortality syndrome, they reduce the fertility in males and they create weaker eggs. And they spotted that in the uh, 1980, late 1980s. Uh, so now all hatcheries that service the Great Lakes, when they take eggs, they put them in a thiamine bath to strengthen them so that they'll a, a better chance to hatch. So the alewife has hurt us, uh, uh, our native fish, the landlock and the lake trout. Oh, I wanted to say one more thing. La uh, about three years ago, Superior, they had to stop st stocking king salmon in Superior. What they had done, the Canadian fisheries uh, from that province and the states that, that they're on, on Lake Superior, failed to adequately anticipate the number of king salmon that were naturally reproduced. They decimated the, uh, the alewife population in the lake. They can no longer stock king salmon. They're still king salmon because they still naturally reproduce, but they're expected to dwindle and dwindle each year. In the meantime, the lake trout have come back like gangbusters. They don't think they'll ever have to stock lake trout again because lake trout are a native fish tremendously vulnerable to the problems with diamonds. The latest uh, <clears throat> is the goby that came in about 10 years, 15 years ago. We were, we were really worried about the goby. It spawns six times a season and it's a prolific egg eater. So uh, there was a, a lot of uh, uh, nervousness about this fish. It came in on the ballast of one of the, one of the, the ocean ships from the Black and Caspian Sea. They get quite large. Uh, I have a buddy that's a diver in the St. Lawrence, and I was talking to him about this. He said, well, let me get you a video. I have a video at 130 feet in the St. Lawrence River of these uh, gobies, and it's, they're thick. You can hardly see the bottom. So he, he's a computer guru. So we took that video. We isolated one picture. We tried to isolate one square foot, and we could count 40 gobies in that square foot. Now, that's, that's a tremendous population. What has happened, though, is they become bass candy. The brown trout have adjusted to it. Uh, I'm not sure if the steelhead have adjusted to it. I've heard they have, and I've heard they hadn't. But in any event, they're soft grade, high fat, high oil, so they become a very good forage fish. We have set the uh, Lake Ontario St. Lawrence River uh, record smallmouth, eight pounds, 12 ounces, two years in a row because of these gobies. Is there any indication as to whether or not um, the fish that are eating them, you know, 
nonstop or actually keeping them in uh, like the the amount of of um, you know eating them as a food source is actually keeping them in check from becoming it seems like it does seem like it because if it didn't i mean they would they would they would be pounding a smallmouth bass uh of beds when we first when they first uh came in and we first, they started to let their presence be known uh, ohio had a, a trophy smallmouth season so you could take one trophy before the regular season opened you know the fish would still be on their beds and what they noticed is you take that male off the bed and before you can release it and get it back in, the gobies have already gone in there and cleaned out the egg. But we're not seeing that now. So, so maybe they're under control. I mean, it, can you imagine being fisheries manager now? <laughs> oh my gosh. And the other thing is we thought they were a shallow water fish and now they've been seen down to 450 feet deep. So it's uh, nature something else. Deep water sculpin is a natural uh, 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 fish here, native fish. Uh, uh, a lake trout really can focus on these. And uh, if you see the goby in the lower right, they're very difficult to tell apart. The only anatomical difference is the way their pectorals attach. Other than that, there's no air bladder. They dominate the lower, four, the bottom 14 inches of the water column. They have a prominent head and, and very prominent pectorals, and they're you know they have a molted complexion. They'd very be difficult for for uh, a non-professional to identify. Talked about the zebra and quagra mussels. Uh, they've been here since '85. They're bottom dwellings, growing clusters. If you put a softball-sized rock in the water. Uh, this spring and took it out next spring, a baseball sized rock, it'd be a softball size with these uh, zebra mussels. The quagras are slightly bigger. They live, uh, or they grow slightly uh, deeper. It is estimated that they filter the whole volume of Lake Ontario four times a year. That's how efficient they are. And while they're filtering that water, they're taking out the one cell animals, the basis for the entire food chain. So they've had a dramatic impact. And certainly they've cleared up the water. Um, it's changed, changed the, the way we fish in Lake Ontario. Hey, Rock, do you yeah. like that sculpin you mentioned, is that found in the Finger Lakes or any of the Finger Lakes as well or no? I, you know, I have no idea. That's a good question. Next time I talk to the fisheries guy, I'll ask. Yeah, good question. I, I would think so because the lakes were attached at one time you know, 12,000 years ago. So it makes sense if they were. Thank you. Ah, there's the Asian carp we're all nervous about. They escaped from a fish farm on the Mississippi in the 90s and then, and they blossomed all up and down the uh, Mississippi River. They're non-native. They're prolific feeders, 10% of body weight a day. Plankton is what they focus on. They reproduce quickly. They can reach 60 to 100 pounds. I've been down south in fish ponds where they put two or three of them in there. They're supposedly hybrids and can't reproduce to control the weeds. <laughs> They're, they are big. <laughs> and, uh, but I can't, it would change the entire fishery. They have seen the DNA in Lake Michigan. The Corps of Engineers said it got there on the legs of birds. It's not real. So there was one caught in Lake Michigan. I don't know. I, I, you know, we're totally dependent on the federal government to keep these out of the Great Lake. It'll be a disaster. The barrier is not as effective as originally thought. Uh, Congress passed a, a law in, in 2014, $16 billion. They're supposed to completely seal, seal the Illinois River and Canal. There's an electrical grid on the river. I think it's running at 40% capacity. The Corps won't up it, although they could, because they don't see the evidence that these fish have made it to the lake. So it's, your guess is as good. I might try to keep up with the research, and the, but uh, you know what I know. Uh, just a few highlights from our uh, landlocked salmon program. That's a nice fish. The metal pool, and again, this is, a, this is one of those spring fish, 50 degree water. And uh, Lamprey control 72, Pacific 
salmon showed up in 74. Steelhead, we started the program in 74. There's a ban on snagging that's been in effect for 25 years. And you go upstream and I can stand in Ellis Cove and look up the river two ways, see 100 fishermen, and I can't see one fishing legal. It's just, it's, it's sad. Uh, we talked about relicensing the hydro dam and, and that minimal flow, which is actually critical to our fishery. Uh, again, the meadow pool, uh, spring fish, both those fish are from the meadow pool, they're gorgeous, gorgeous fish. The pink bugger, that's, that's a good springtime uh, for, for steelhead and, and for these uh, landlocks up there. Tail out of the meadow pool and I put in this picture of the smallmouth just to show you guys. This is a year-round fishery up here now. There's a tremendous smallmouth fishery in the summer. The landlocks will run in the summer. When I first started catching landlocks, I was mowing the grass for Douglaston Lodges, and I was taking care of the uh, flower beds. So every afternoon at 2 o'clock, I go down, take my shower in the river, and fish. And so I did catch some landlocks in the summer. I was down there a lot. Now it's open all summer, so anybody can come up and fish. So pending your questions, I'm, I probably bored everybody. And there's no test. Mama. Any questions? Uh, for Rock? Uh, 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 hey, uh, John. Uh, uh, I, I would just like to say this is a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Thanks, Rock, for, for presenting. Uh, you're very knowledgeable. And we learned an awful lot about the Great Lakes and the, uh, the landlocks. Um, so I understand that catching a landlocked salmon is rather rare. Is that, is that the case? Well, yeah, yeah, yes, you, you, yeah. I, I, I would tell you this. It, uh, I have great confidence when I go down there in the spring, and the, and the water temp is fifty, and I really focus on on landlocks. Uh, we've had good years. We've had, uh, I've had clients. I had two clients hook four each in three hours. That was a springtime, fifty degree water, and. Uh, uh, in the summer runs, I've had guys hook a couple. Uh, I just, you know, I'm 75 and I'm not guiding as much as I did. Uh, so for three years, I'm not in contact every day with the river like I used to be. So I, 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 it just seems to me that these fish, a lot of these fish are being killed this time of year as they drop back to the lake when all those, all that snagging going, going up. And, and, uh, They've stopped, they've, they've reduced salmon stocking for three years, 20%. That's based on the, uh, the alewives in the lake. The biggest hurdle to reintroducing a sustaining population of landlocks is the alewife, is the simonase. So if something happens like it happened in Superior, I think these fish will come back. Rock, uh, oh, Kirk, did you have another question? I didn't know if you had a follow-up. Yeah, 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 I wanted. To, I had a follow-up question. Um, so I think it was Spay Nation a couple couple years ago when I was there. I I actually hooked one of these and landed a little small one. Uh, Mike, I know that there's uh, there's a lot of effort by independent hatcheries to help with the Atlantic <laughs> salmon. The landlocks is. My question is, what, what's, what's your gauge on how important that is to the sportsman and, uh, and how important that support is uh, for, for the fishery going forward? Well, any local sport is extremely important. I'll give you an example. Uh, a large percentage of our king salmon are being raised in pens on the lake. There's seven pens run by clubs. The hatchery hatches the, 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 uh, the salmon, and when they're healthy enough or large enough, they go to these pens on the lake. 
those pen raised salmon are two and a half to three times more likely to survive than a hatchery fish. That is huge. Wow. So, so, so I would think that any club in, in, in the, there's a TU chat, our TU chat up here uh, 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 does stocking in Fish Creek and, and the, the trips to Fish Creek. I've caught a small landlocks six, seven inches in Fish Creek. And uh, we used to see, I mean, I, I, like I say, I'm not on the river that much, but in the summer I used to see little pods, I don't know, 10, 12, 20 fish, three to five landlocks come up through. I caught one one time, it, one hit my indicator and one hit the fly at the same time. So we used to, you know, I, but I'm just not on the river that much. Yeah, so I have a... Yeah, go ahead. So uh, um, I, <clears throat> I have a place on Tuca Lake and, you know, it's, it's sort of a natural experiment going on there because all the alewives died and the DEC has stocked it with Cisco. Uh, we're still waiting to find out if the Cisco took, um, but it, it dawned on me just now that <clears throat> if the Cisco managed to take over and displace the alewives, then perhaps we could get some landlocks in Cuca Lake. Right now, they they don't even stock landlocks and browns anymore there. Wow. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Here's hoping that uh, something develops out of that. Well, I, I am the you uh, having a place at uh, Cuca. I used to fish, I used to, well, I spent 30 plus years in the Army, and every time I was in the States, I'd, and I could come up for a week in October, Dad and I would drive up from Painted Post, and we would fish Cuca for smallmouth, because at that time, Cuca had the biggest smallmouth in the, in, the, in, in the state. It was an unbelievable, and it was gorgeous. What a gorgeous fishery. Yeah, it's still, still a good smallmouth fishery, for sure. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I think you're right. I think if they lose the alewives, you'd have a shot. There's two, uh, two studies uh, that the New York State did one and Canada did one. This is, you know, all the, just like any research paper, all the, the scientific names, all, all the, journals, everything listed, you know, it's kind of struggle, but I read them both. Both of them said that the biggest hurdle for the landlocked salmon was the alewife, overcoming the uh -huh. Right. <clears throat> so if, do, 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 are there some landlocked that will spawn in the lake if, if the uh, availability of creeks, you know, is, is insufficient? You know, they're hardy fish. They, uh, I mean, when they when they they spread out all over through the Finger Lakes, and you know, when they first, you know, thousand ten thousand years ago, they were in all these lakes. Uh, they were in all these lakes uh, up until the middle 18, 1850s and eighteen sixties. So mm. uh, somehow they survived the effect of global warming. I, I I don't know. I mean, this is not the warmest the, the planet's got. I mean, for heaven's sakes, Leif Erikson grew grapes in Greenland in 900. Yeah. <clears throat> Good question. Yeah. I don't know. So you outlined a number of things that um, you seem to be kind of a fan of in terms of efforts to, to restore salmon to Lake Ontario and the tributary systems. Yeah attached to it, but what's, what's something that you would like to see happen in the future that's, that's not happening right now, if you had to pick something? All right. Well, I, they made some new rules uh, this year, so I think the DEC's headed in the right way. We used to be able to take three steelhead out of the river, and about 10 years ago, they reduced it to one, which I thought was, was, was the right thing to do, but they didn't change the brown trout limit. The, people could still take three of these brown trout. So you're taking seven, eight, 10 pound browns or steelhead out of the river. It takes a long time to grow that fish. <clears throat> the Pacific salmon are not, uh, they, they eat a lot. I mean, if you didn't stock as many Pacific salmon, there'd be more forage for, for other fish who would use it more efficiently, your browns, your steelhead, your rainbows. Uh, 
So I'm really ambivalent about the, about these salmon. But like I say, this these salmon have captured the loyalty of a large segment of the of the fishing population, and they'd be really pissed if 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 uh, if anybody did anything dramatic to st the stocking levels of these of these uh, uh, kings. So I, I yeah I prefer less kings. Uh, I prefer a real concerted effort to bring the landlock back. I mean, it's a native fish. Uh, it's you know people pay ten thousand dollars to go to, to to Canada for two weeks to fish for them or a week. I mean, it, they used to call it the five thousand dollar fish, and that was thirty years ago. Okay. Any other questions? Anything about flies, about any of the history? You got a free, you got a favorite rod and, and reel outfit that you use, Rock, for the Atlantic? Well, I'm a, a for I'm a switch rod guy now for almost everything, cool. even stream trout. I'm, I'm I'm doing the what they call the trout spay a lot. Uh, although I have a a three way, I have eighty two rods. <laughs> Forgive me, but uh, my favorite is a little eight foot three inch uh, uh, three weight. But uh, for the Salmon River, I, I fish uh, uh, switch rods. Now, I'll tell you why. Uh, a switch rod's real name is a single handed spay. It's a shorter spay rod, but it's short enough where you can use one hand. The switch rod is much easier to roll cast, and roll casting is important on, on the river here. You it's an easier to mend. You get a longer presentation. You get a little bit more leverage for the hook set. And if you have a large fish, it's tiring your shoulder or your arm. You can put that two hand uh, rod handle up against your forearm or you can actually put it in your belly. So for older guys like me, I mean, it, it, it saves your shoulders. It, but it's, I think it's a more effective tool. Uh, I do use a six, seven weight single handed rod for dry flies in the summer in the upper fly zone. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, whatever you, what people tell, uh, ask me what rod to buy and, and I have some favorites. I always tell a person, once you know the size, the style and the weight of the rod you want, go to a, a good fly shop, pick rods with a good warranty Pick them all up. The one that feels best is the one you should buy because this is confident. Fishing is all about confidence. And the rod that feels good to you gives you that little more confidence, I think. So that's my advice on that. But I am a, a big believer in switch rods here. Others? Any other questions? Did you say you have 83 rods? No, I, no, that's a gross, a gross. I only have 82. <laughs> oh. So my wife is right here. Could you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> what happened was in, 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 uh, I was 10 years old and, and 55 and my father, uh, uh, one of my uncles came down and said, I'm going to teach you how to build rods. So I started building rods when I was 10 and, and I haven't stopped. <laughs> Way cool. But I, I know how to sneak him in the house. I'm, I'm an old special forces guy. I, I, I got a good a degree in stealth. <laughs> hey, hey, Rocky, uh, I fished uh, when I was a young person in northern Quebec, and they had a fish there they called the Wananish. Is that oh, the wow. same fish? The Wananish. One in each. I think it's a, I think it's a, a native uh, term for the landlocked salmon. Oh, I have no idea. Lucky I, you. Oh, it was it was very cool. Yeah, we were trolling. Yeah, I was kind of very young. Yeah. Any other questions for Rock? All right. Rock, we want to thank you a ton for your presentation tonight. 
Um, and, and thank you so much for allowing us to record this. We're going we're gonna to share it with some other chapter members and folks who couldn't make it tonight for various reasons. So um, if I guess if anyone has any, doesn't have any last questions, we can kind of, you know, call it a, call it a, uh, an event. Um, we'll try to get this up on our YouTube channel within a few days or so. But thanks so much for, for being here and joining us. Yeah, I enjoyed it immensely. Darren, you were a great help. Got me over my confidence curve. I, I feel like a new man. <laughs> Thank you. No, that was good. That took that only took a minute, and this was extremely informative. I mean, there's just so much in here I didn't, I had no idea about. So, yeah. um, yep. thanks. Thank you. Yeah. yeah Thank well you. done. <laughs> yeah, well, very, very well done. If you, thanks, if you Ron. We appreciate you, one, man. I got him. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks a bunch. Yep. Tight lines. <laughs>